Hi, it's Josh Rubin. Anyone that knows New York City knows that real estate and food go hand in hand. Join my friends and I as we take you to some of the best restaurants the city has to offer. guest today is none other than Sandor Kraus, one of the leading transactional attorneys here in the city. Sandy and his team do over 400 transactions a year. Sandy, thanks so much for joining us today. Josh. Yeah. And thanks to the folks at Blue Smoke for hosting us. Um, Sandy, you do so many transactions here in the city. I know you see a lot. Um, tell us, what are you seeing in today's market? It's tough to say. I mean, generally speaking, I'm seeing right now sophisticated buyers. Buyers that are taking their time, figuring it out, negotiating everything. If it's a new development, they want transfer taxes, they want legal fees, they want resident manager's unit, they want everything. So I'm seeing a lot of buyers say, hey, Sandy, I want you to go to contract, but I also want you to take a look at this deal too, and then this deal too, and then this deal too. We'll figure out on these four, which one we're gonna buy. Right. Happens a lot later. So what you're seeing is a lot of buyers who are asking a lot of questions but they're also negotiating a lot of deals in parallel to one another. Right, it's because I think the rise of inventory, I think they know that things are coming online, figuring prices may be depressed a little bit. I see that, but on the same side, I also see a lot of buyers wanting to go to contract same day. They want to snatch up the deal, right? right. So Sandy, I need you to go to contract. I need a, a due diligence done in a day, yeah. right? Or I don't really care about it at all. I want this deal because I know it's a good price. Yeah. Right. So I see that a lot later too. So you're seeing buyers who are seeing, they're recognizing opportunity and they're stepping up yep. and they want to move quickly yep. and get it done. Yep, I see a lot of that lately. Yeah, so there, there seems to be a, a fear of loss, right? Yeah. They yeah. don't want to lose the opportunity and so they're moving quickly to get it done. I think in New York in general, I think you see a lot of, you've certainly seen this, the, have the cyclical nature of it and yep. how people are scared about what the next cycle is going to be, right? So right. is it going to be, it's a buyer's market is it going to turn to a seller's market next month? So right. I got to get on it really quickly before yep. it turns, because when it turns, it turns pretty drastically. That's right. And we're seeing that just in the last few weeks with activity sort of plateauing um, to the downside, and now we're seeing an uptick yep. uh, with bidding wars returning. Uh, we just did a couple deals this past week with uh, things going over the asking price again. Right. So uh, it's interesting. We're seeing the sort of rebalancing, right? Yeah, and it's happening sort of very quickly, like my office in a general, you know, we'll have a few deals a day come in and then all of a sudden you'll have 10 deals in one day, right? And you see that, and I think it's, it also depends on, you know, the month or everything. I'm, I'm not much of a barometer of the market. It's hard for it to tell how hot the market is depending on the volume that I do, but yeah. I can tell you, if your team sends me a bunch of deals, it means that things are going quickly and they want it done quick. And that's the way it is. And that's a signal of a real buyer's market. Yeah. So Sandy, you know, the reason I wanted to have you here today in Blue Smoke, which is uh, some of the city's uh, best barbecue, yes. uh, is you actually went to school in South Carolina, right? I did, yes. Yeah. I did. And so I, I know that you recognize good barbecue when you see it. I do. And so here we are at, at Danny Meyer's Blue Smoke on 27th and Park, um, and it's really the combination of uh, two amazing things, which is New York City and amazing barbecue. Yeah. And uh, I'm a bit of a barbecue aficionado. Are you? And so, um, you know, there are three ways that I judge good barbecue. Uh -huh. <clears throat> the first is the ribs. Yeah. And uh, make sure that they're, they're tender enough, but they're not so tender because that's a sign of cheating in barbecue uh, because a lot of people do what's called a poor boil process where they <laughs> put it in the oven essentially and then they put it on the grill. So uh, we don't do that here at Blue Smoke, and we certainly don't do that uh, in my experience when we use the, the green egg smoker or, right. uh, or my barbecue grill at home. <laughs> the second, we have the brisket. And so uh, the brisket here is fantastic. And then the third, of course, is the chicken and uh, the quality of the rub and the, the texture of the chicken, how, how uh, well cooked it is. So, um, Sandy, I, I know that you've done some barbecuing in your yep. in your day. Um, what's your favorite part of barbecue? For me, it generally speaking, of course, is the brisket, right? I can't cook a brisket. I try, I have my green egg at home. Sure. I try, I can't do it, right? right? And right. to me, I found out over the years of trying the brisket, 
It's the one thing that everyone tells me that I ignore the most is leave <laughs> it in there. Yep. Forever. Yeah. It always comes out chewy. It's because it's never cooked enough, right? So that's what I'm looking for, real sort of tenders. Also, for me, it's sausage. sausage you can get any sausage. Thing? I get it done. This is, to me, this blue smoke is a top two or three place barbecue in the city yeah. for me. Oh, Absolutely. Totally agree. Yeah, totally it's agree. fantastic. So um, tell us a little bit about how you got into what you're doing today, because it's such a unique niche to, to focus on residential transactions. Yeah. You know, you meet a lot of attorneys in the city, yeah. right? Yeah. A lot of them are, uh, you know, intellectual property specialists. Um, you know, of course, you meet your, your M&A attorneys, your commercial litigators, yeah. but residential transactions, how did you get your start? So, you know, it's a good question. For me, I learned, I have a good friend of mine who is a, uh, specializes in severance only. Okay, very successful is like employment, employment severance, right? Mm -hmm. He's very successful law firm, a friend of my family's. And the first thing that I asked him was, you know, how'd you do this? How'd you get into this? And he said, sure. Sandy, look, here's the thing. If you want to start your own law firm, you have to be really good at one thing, right? Mm -hmm. And what happened was, is I worked for a firm for a very, very, very short period of time. And during that time, I saw my boss do a real estate closing. And I said, this looks okay. Yeah. I could do this. Yeah. And my demographic were a bunch of my friends that were looking to move into the city and buy apartments. Right. I mean, what could be better than an opportunity for a kid that has a bunch of friends that are looking to buy? How can I help them? Sure. Right. And this is the kind of business as a residential real estate transactional attorney that you can go to a blue smoke and meet somebody and do their closing six, six weeks later because yeah. they're looking to buy. Right. It's very hard for an attorney to walk into blue smoke and decide that they're going to do an an M&A transaction, it doesn't really work like that. So being able to get those clients on a personal basis really got me into it. It's not a very difficult profession. It doesn't take um, um, an Har a Harvard LLM to finish it up. The truth is, is what it takes is someone that's gonna be out there, be aggressive, find the people, but also have a, you know, have what we have, which is a personality, someone that you can connect with, people right. you can connect with right. and help them. And, and, and to me, what's better than helping people to find their homes? Yeah. Right. I'm yeah. sure you experience this too. I mean, you've been doing it for long enough where you're starting to see people buy houses and all of a sudden they have kids. Right. And yeah. maybe you're even doing right. something for their kids. Yeah. The multi-generational right? customer. It's, that's it's, right. It's amazing how it keeps on going. So that's really how I got into it. I figured it was a field that I could specialize in and I could do. It wasn't hard enough. It wasn't too much um, uh, uh, paperwork at the time, although now it seems like it's a lot of paperwork. And then I figured, why not specialize in this one thing? And that's how it happened, just evolved into that. Sure. Yeah. You know, that, that's really interesting because what you're talking about is the ability to be in front of people, build a rapport, have that connection and a foundation of trust. Right. right. Yeah. And that's a lot of that's a lot of what we do uh, in everyday relationships right. and building those one by one and ensuring that people understand that we have the knowledge and experience to get it across the finish line in a way that we're caring about them. And so they actually trust in us in such a way that they often refer to us, as you touched on to their family members, not just their friends and colleagues, but you know, I've done deals with parents who have entrusted me to find their kids' homes, yeah, and yeah. then their kids refer me to their friends. So it, it's really a, an interesting process an interesting that we go field, through. I feel like this is the only field, I think you'll agree with me, so much emotion is poured into these deals, right? I do a lot of commercial transactions. Nobody cares at all about the emotions. Right. It's a business transaction. That's right. But for these types of things, you go, you become like one with these people, right? They're mm -hmm. buying a house for their for their future, right? And it's important. So it could be good and bad. You know, you get the bad with it too. You get the emotions that come along with it, but you also get the happiness of seeing people so happy once they do that walkthrough and close that in that deal, yeah. right? Yeah, it's often an emotional process. Right. There's highs and lows. Yep. Um, but you know, what what's good is when we actually get it to the finish line and we're at the closing, people can breathe a sigh of relief, yep. whether you're representing the seller or the buyer. Yes, yes. And so you have a wife and... I do. How, many, how many kids do you have? <laughs> I have two children, uh -huh. Hannah and Harper. They're 11 and 7. Um, and, uh, and, and my wife is uh, from Rockland County. Cool. We've lived in Manhattan for, uh, you know, ever since we've known each other for uh, almost 18 years now. And so you're on the Upper West Side. Right? I am, yeah. And uh, what are some of your favorite restaurants in that neighborhood? In that neighborhood, look, the Upper West Side is a, 
is a good one because there are a few select restaurants with Gennaro's is a really great Italian place up there. Um, there's um, a lot of um, small little uh, pizza places up there. Motorino is up there now in the Upper West Side, which is one of my favorite. Uh, there's of course the classic New York icon, Barney Greengrass. Right. Right, which is yep. right up there, which is one of my favorite things to do for brunch every once in a while yeah. to really uh, be gluttonous. Sturgeon, right? That's right. I don't eat sturgeon. I go for a bagel and cream cheese. I'm good enough. Um, and of course, you know, for me, the Upper West Side represented um, a real, real New York to me. That was right. real classic New York, um, Riverside Parks. Um, it has a good location to our house upstate, so we're able sure. to leave there. Um, and we, we wouldn't live anywhere else in the city. Yeah, yeah, we love it. And um, you know, having uh, lived in Midtown as well, yeah. I know you must have some favorite places around there too. Right, so I have, a little quirky, I have this one Italian place in New York City. I'm gonna give it a plug right now. Yeah. The best Italian in New York City. It's called Il Tonello. Il Tonello, huh. 56th Street between 5th and 6th. Classic, classic Italian. You might as well be on Arthur Avenue right there. Really? Amazing. I'm going to take you there once too. Um, it's my, it got the best Caesar salad in the country. Really? Okay. So there's Il Tonello. I'm a lover of Caesar salad. <laughs> we have Il Tonello. Of course, um, if you want to talk about real restaurants in New York for me, you could take me to Katz's Deli any time of the week. <laughs> right? That's my, that's, that's my thing. You know, I used to go to Katz's Deli at two o'clock in the morning because yes. they're open late. Yes. And uh, I used to just get half sour pickles. Some of the best half sour pickles in the city are at Katz's Deli. And then you also have, uh, you know, Second Avenue Deli where before it was relocated. And then of course, if you really want to get down to my favorite New York spot, it's Peter Luger's in Brooklyn. Oh. Right? So I could get a slab of bacon and yeah. a steak and I'm good for the week. You love your bacon. I do love my bacon. <laughs> I love my pork. Sandy, you know, we talked a little bit about what we're seeing in, in uh, the market as far as buyers and running parallel deals. And then we have some select few buyers who just want to get it done. Um, where do you see things trending? Obviously, we went through the last couple of years with some degree of uncertainty. But, you know, six, 12 months out, how do you see things? So, you know, for me, I have such confidence in a small little island in New York, right? That I feel like New York City is coming back, right? That the pockets of, you know, Brooklyn was it for how long, right? It's all Brooklyn, all Brooklyn, Brooklyn. For, for me, it seems like people are starting to really see an uptick in, in being able to purchase those places in New York that you couldn't do 10 years ago or eight years ago, right? Um, uh, so I think trending moving forward, in my view, look, there's a lot of inventory coming online, right? But to me, I have confidence that things are going to uh, plateau for a little while, right? Um, and then, you know, whether there's a recession in 2009 to 2020, we don't know yet, right? Yep. Um, but the truth is, is that I feel like the market is going to stay steady for a little while. And then I'm going to, I just have a feeling it's going to go up. I'm, I'm no... Uh, crystal ball but i just I, I i have a lot of confidence in this place yeah right you're right you're right you know historically manhattan has gone through these periods of uncertainty whether it's terrorist attacks or recessions or tech booms and busts um and it's come back and when it comes back it comes back stronger than ever right so i have no doubt that we're going to see some softening in the future right but ultimately what's going to happen is we're going to come back stronger than ever Right. You know, I've been doing it over 20 years now. Right. So I've been through a few of these between long term capital, September 11th, um, uh, you know, the, the tech boom, right. tech bust, and then, of course, Lehman Brothers. 2008. Um, right. yep. 2008, 2009. Yep. Every time we've come back stronger than ever. Right. Sandy, last thing. Um, I recently heard that they're considering uh, implementing a pied de terre tax. In other words, people who use their homes as pied de and if it's north of $5 million, they're gonna levy an additional uh, transfer tax on the transaction. Do you think that that'll impact the market at all? I, I'll tell you why I don't think it will, okay? Um, you know, New York City is infamous for their funny taxes, right? We have, we have a mortgage tax, we have a mansion tax, right? You pay a mansion tax on anything over a million dollars. That is not a mansion in New York, right? No, they're, they're antiquated statutes and New York City 
you know, they're always looking to, to garner whatever they can in the market. They were looking for years to impose a, a, a mortgage tax on uh, co-ops, right? It never happened. Um, uh, um, one, I'm, I'm doubtful if this piano tax, will, piano terror tax will actually happen. But to me, it looks like New York is such a market where people want to come in that they just understand that there's transactional costs that go on in New York. Right. So maybe they look at it and you explain to a client, hey, you know what? You got to pay a mansion tax, you got to pay a mortgage tax, and you got to pay a piano terror tax. I've never had a client say, uh, I, I got to pay a mortgage tax and the mansion. I'm not paying the mansion tax, right? It just happens to be part of the transaction. So as good broker. Right, that will explain that ultimately. We'll just sort of pass it off as this is what it is. Right. Everyone else is paying it. Yep. You're going to have to pay it. And maybe, maybe it would prevent a few people here and there from coming to New York. But if you want to buy a Pieta Terra in New York, you're going to buy a Pieta Terra in New York. Great. Sandy, I appreciate Absolutely. you joining us. Sandor Krauss, it was a pleasure sitting down today. Thanks so much for taking Absolutely. the time. Thanks, Josh.